Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the seventh edition of Latin American Pathways in honor of Professor Werner Baer. Werner Baer was the Georges Lehmann Professor of Economics at the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign. He wrote the book, The Brazilian Economy, Its Growth and Development, as well as several other books and academic articles on Latin American economies. Professor Baer taught at uh, Yale University from 61 to 65, University of Vanderbilt from 65 to 74, and the University of Illinois from 74 until his passing in 2016. He encouraged many researchers to study Latin American economies and advised a number of students from the US, Latin America, and Europe. Werner Baer was born in Offenbach, Germany. He received his uh, bachelor's degree from Cooney Queens College in 1953 and a master's and PhD from Harvard University in 55 and 1958, respectively. We all are very honored to be here uh, in this uh, event um, in honor of Professor Baer, as we all uh, at one point studied or worked in uh, University of Illinois. It's a pleasure to um, introduce the um, participants and the speakers at this uh, event now. We're gonna start with a keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Alexander Contombini from, also got his PhD from the University of Illinois. Um, he is the chief representative of the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements Office for the Americas and he's the former president of Central Bank of Brazil from uh, 2011 to 2016. Um, I, myself, am Dan Biller. I'm doing the introduction. And after the next panelists, I will uh, pass the baton to Dr. Eduardo Gozal, who was also at the University of Illinois for his master's and did his PhD in the New School of Economic Research. After the presentation of Dr. Tombini, we'll have the perspectives from the US with John Welch. Uh, he is a research for Emerging Markets uh, Incorporated professor at the University of McKenzie, uh, the IPA fellow and REM. And we'll have the perspectives from Argentina with Dr. Diego Petacola, uh, who is an IIP researcher and a professor at the University of, um, of Buenos Aires. This event is done in partnership between Aqua Wealth Management, uh, Kramer Business School, uh, Graduate Business School uh, at Rollins College, the Centro de Liberdade Econômica of University of Mackenzie, and the IIEP at University of Buenos Aires. Uh, I would like also to complete this introduction with a short disclaimer from the FGV, uh, who is also a partner in this event, Fundação Getúlio Vargas. I want to clarify that the opinions expressed in this event are the responsibility of each of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the opinion of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. In addition, the speakers in this event agreed to participate of their own free will and consent to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later on FGV official channels. So without further ado, let me pass the baton to Dr. Alexandre Tombini. Uh, Alexandre, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, let me at the outset Thank Eduardo Gozo and Paulo Tenani for this invitation. Very happy to be here. And I also have to do my own disclaimer and the views expressed here are my own, not necessarily those of the Bank for International Settlements, the institution that I represent. So uh, thank you. Uh, well, let me just greet my fellow panelists as well, Diego, uh, John, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, in good health uh, these days. But thank you very much for inviting me to, to talk here in the Latin American Pathways. 
in tribute to Professor Werner Baer. I have uh, been part of other uh, events in, in his memory, but this is a special one with so many fellow uh, colleagues from the University of Illinois. The, the passion of Professor Baer and his studies on inflation, growth, and development in Latin America, and particularly in Brazil, is admirable. His contributions have not aged and are more relevant today than ever. It's an honor for me and a privilege uh, to be able to share perspective, my perspective on uh, what we have learned and uh, what we are now, where we are now, and what challenges and opportunities our region will face in the future. So the question that was posed to me was one of our inflation, uh, I should say high inflation and low growth inevitable in Latin America. My short answer to this is I don't think so. I have to admit that the list of challenges is long, uh, but there are no grounds in my view for fatalism in our region. Over the past three decades, Latin American countries have built up strong macrofinancial frameworks. Between the turn of the millennium and last year, inflation in most countries of the region was lower and more stable than any time in the 20th century, despite large shocks. And I should say in the last quarter of the last century, uh, that was the case. Uh, financial crisis, a perennial feature of the past have been notably absent in our region. I think this track record shows that good policies can and do make a difference. Today, the challenge is to build up on, the, on those achievements, get inflation back to target and embark on a trajectory of high and sustainable growth. Macroeconomic and financial stability are necessary conditions for this, but they are not enough. We also need a structural policy to make our economies more competitive and dynamic, social policy to make growth inclusive, and environmental policies to make development sustainable. What are the lessons that we have learned uh, from decades past? I think in most Latin America, the 20th century was marked by massive swings in economic activity, high inflation, and financial instability. This changed in the late 1990s and early 2000s, when most central banks became independent or autonomous and their ability to finance the public sector, that is to provide monetary financing, was severely restricted. Most countries abandoned fixed exchange rates and chose a flexible regime with inflation targeting being the new nominal anchor for their economies. Central bank independence is key but it needs to be accompanied by sustainable public finance to keep inflation low and stable. Most countries took steps to consolidate public finances and strengthen fiscal institutions, for instance, by introducing fiscal responsibility laws, and in some cases, fiscal councils. Countries also opened their economies to trade and foreign capital to prevent the dangerous booms and busts that follow past efforts on financial liberalization, as was the case in the 1970s in the Southern Corn, they this time round adopted policies to mitigate currency mismatches. Financial markets have also become deeper thanks in part to pension reforms and removal of legal and administrative obstacles to foreign investment. And having suffered from financial crisis in the 1980s and 1990s, authorities strengthen their banking systems by requiring higher quality, larger capital reserves, and improving prudential supervision. Notably, they took these steps well before the great uh, financial uh, crisis. In short, at the beginning of this new millennium, countries adopted macrofinancial frameworks that deliver low and stable inflation and financial Stability. Slide two, please. So I will show you here in, in this uh, second slide of my presentation. This, this new fr framework was successful. Inflation fell sharply and interest rate were reduced. 
as public finances became more sustainable, countries were in a position to be able to use fiscal policy in a more counter cyclical way. While this shift in policy was clearly helped by low inflation globally, it was not all a smooth sailing. Even with greater fiscal discipline in the, than in the past, the problems of excessive indebtedness or boom and bust, bust cycles in financial markets did not go away. With more open economies, policymakers had to deal with the ups and downs of the global economy. Central banks had to deal with large and volatile capital flows and swings in external monetary and liquidity conditions, which amplified the economic cycle and increased output volatility. Other challenges include financial stability risks, such as excessive reliance on short-term debt and unhedged currency exposures. Unlike in most uh, advanced economies, the interest rate instrument was not sufficient to address all these challenges. In a world of, uh, with large fluctuation in capital flows and international asset prices, the sole use of monetary policy instrument may pose two dilemmas. First, if inflation is already close to target, inflation targeting central banks may have less room to raise interest rates to curb excessive credit growth, excessive risk taking. Second, an increase in short-term interest rates may attract further capital flows. But I should say that in general, most central banks in the region manage to navigate through those episodes of strong capital inflows and outflows quite successfully. It is no co coincidence that most Latin American economies did not experience any major crisis when the GFC hit in 2008 or even during the taper tantrum in 2013. And why is that? I think an important reason is the use of multiple instruments, the buildup of buffers and the inclusion of financial stability considerations in the work of central banking. Indeed, central banks in the region highlighted the use of several instruments in a survey and a report coordinated by the BIS and published in our website in 2021. In fact, the central banks of Latin America have made use of not only the policy interest rate, but also of macroprudential tools and foreign exchange interventions. Importantly, they have done so not only during recessions or periods of financial stress, but also during booms. This multiple instrument approach has increased financial resilience. It has reduced the sensitivity of the financial system to change in the exchange rate. In good times, it reduced the fear of floating and increased the scope for exchange rate to act as a shock absorber during bad times. Like three. So let me now turn to uh, where are we now? Despite these uh, successes, we now face new challenges arising from a unique set of events. As we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic with major fiscal support and supply chain disruptions, inflation is high almost everywhere. Growth is declining and central banks around the globe are hiking rates. The war in Ukraine further complicates an already difficult situation. As you know, commodity price surged in the first half of this year, although they have mostly returned to the levels prevailing before the invasion. As you can see in this slide, inflation has gone up in 2022. It has peaked in a few economies in the region, but remains at very high levels virtually everywhere. In quite a number of countries, the increase in inflation would have been larger had fiscal measures not constrained the energy and food price increases. On the positive side, and you see here in the right-hand side panel, uh, long-term inflation expectations, which is the uh, red dot, it's, uh, it's around the, the levels uh, of central banks' objectives. So, I should say that inflation expectations over the long term have remained 
remarkably uh, well anchored, while uh, in the short and medium term to 2022 and 2023, they have been, and they are right now, the expectations above uh, the inflation targets. Moreover, a sharp increase in inflation, and in particular in salient prices like food, affects people in Latin America even more than those in advanced economies. In Latin America, an increase in inflation fueled by food prices usually translate into an increase in poverty. There are at least three reasons for that. Let me show you here in slide four. First, a, a large share of the population has precarious personal finances and spend most of their income on essential items. Second, a large share of household expenditures is on food, as we see in this, in this slide, especially in the lower brackets of the income distribution. And third, given the still limited level of financial inclusion, there are few possibilities to access financial products that could help protect against inflation. Meanwhile, uh, growth and consumption recovered fast in the late 2020 and 2021. 21. This was due in part to expansionary policies, including large pension withdrawals in some countries in the region and high global demand, main, mainly from the United States. In most economies, output recovered to pre-pandemic levels and labor markets remained strong. Even in 2022, higher commodity price improved the terms of trade and push up growth further as shown in this slide. For 2023, however, analysts expect a clear deceleration with the possibility of some economies even facing mild recession as you see in this slide. Latin American central banks have been bold and decisive in the face of rising inflation. As you see in this slide, they have raised the policy rates decisively. And they did so well before their uh, peers, especially their peers in advanced economies. And you can see in the red and the black diamonds in this uh, screen that according to market consensus uh, forecast rate uh, policy rates are close uh, to their landing levels at the end of 2022. As domestic and global rates rose, financial conditions tightened considerably, as shown in, in this slide, along with higher bond yields and CDS spreads. Exchange rates were more stable, at least for most countries in the region. Interest rate in increases led to higher carry to risk indicators, yield curves flattened in most economies, and even invert, inverted in some. Global financial markets were also very volatile in recent months. So far, they have continued to function well in most cases. Yet we know that risk of episodes tend to hit emerging markets particularly hard. Overall, let me say that early actions by central banks in our region have helped economies and financial markets to cope well with higher volatility. That said, monetary authorities should guard against the risk of excessive optimism by market participants in assuming a benign disinflation path going forward. Let me now turn to the challenge ahead. At the moment, the first and most important challenge for central bank is getting inflation back to target. Inflation in some major economies in Latin America seem to be peaking if they haven't uh, peaked already, as shown on, on this uh, slide. You see there in the, in the left panel, the solid uh, lines are uh, actual numbers and then the dotted ones are projections by consensus for a guess. However, it, it, needs, uh, it needs to decline uh, substantially uh, further down to get close to the level central banks and population are comfortable with, in particular to the inflation target established for the central banks to be pursuing at this juncture. 
the first stage of this inflation could come from a combination of lower global demand an easing of supply bottlenecks, lower commodity prices, and the impact of monetary tightening put in place the last year and a half. These temporary factors could push inflation down relatively fast, as we are experiencing right now. The second phase of this inflation, however, would be more difficult. It is possible, perhaps even likely, that the pace of this inflation will slow down as second round effects from index indexation clauses or high inflation expectations kick in. While wage increases both within and outside our region have generally remained well below the rate of inflation, there are signs that wage negotiations are becoming more frequent and indexation clause, clauses more common in some countries. And even if expectations remain well anchored, for now, as shown on, on slide eight right panel, as you see there, they could each up as inflation remains elevated. A warning sign is the fact that core inflation, which reflects the inflation trend, is still high and up in most countries. The second challenge is to find the optimal time to stop increasing rates. Given the amount of tightening already in the pipeline, there could be a case for central banks to pause at some point and wait for the effects of the cumulative tightening to slow inflation. Yet, even if domestic conditions warrant a pause, it may be difficult to do so owing to three factors. First, the Federal Reserve and other advanced economy central banks may continue to tighten for some time. While interest rate differentials are high, it can be difficult for Latin American central banks to decouple from the Fed and follow a different policy trajectory. Especially for countries where inflation is not yet on a clear path downwards, a pause could result in a loss of confidence by external and internal investors, leading to capital outflows and depreciation. That in turn will create additional inflationary pressures. Second, a possible retrenchment of global investors. The global environment is exceptionally uncertain, which contributes to the significant market volatility that we have seen in recent, they will say, weeks or months. Core markets, such as the US Treasury market, have become less liquid, and shifting to other markets is no solution since they are even less liquid. And third, uncertainty about fiscal policy and other policies may force central banks to keep rates higher than would otherwise be optimal given the domestic conditions. So while uh, financial conditions in the, in, in, the, in the region have already tightened, we could see even more spillovers from higher global interest rates. Moreover, this would happen even if the tightening in advanced economies is well telegraphed, well communicated to the markets, as it has been the case in recent episodes. The third challenge is low growth, both cyclically and structurally. First, the post-pandemic rebound is predictably running out of steam, setting the scene for more normal rates of expansion. Second, Financial conditions are much tighter in the wake of monetary policy tightening inside and outside the region. And third, and from a more structural perspective, there is less external stimulus given the lower global growth, mainly uh, from China. Also, accumulated savings during the pandemic, which had supported private consumption in the recovery, are exhausted in some economies, and also due to pension withdrawals in some countries in our region. Uh, fifth and last, uh, I would say political risk in the region is likely to remain high. And as you can see in this slide, long-term growth expectations for the region have fallen substantially in the wake of the pandemic, and even more so since 2014 when such data uh, became available. In the medium term, expected fiscal deficits and high public debt could be yet another drag on growth if they translate in higher risk premium. As you see in this slide, 
in the last panel, structural fiscal surplus are not expected until 2026. You can see this in the red dots. And on the right side, you can see that that is at the historical high levels from our uh, recent history in, in Latin America. So I shall, shall say that uh, macro financial stability is very important, but it's not enough. The region needs to uh, rekindle new reforms to invigorate growth. But I, I, was, I will end uh, my presentation, uh, this uh, part of our discussion here with some positives. So some factors that could support growth across Latin America, across our region. First, Household and firms and financial institutions appear to be in good enough shape to weather the downturn, since there are no major imbalances in the private sector and debt profiles seem generally healthy. The impact of uh, the digital revolution may tra translate into greater efficiency and higher productivity. More efficient payments and new digital services could be a boon to economies and particularly to firms and households in remote areas of our region. Of course, this will require and is requiring the appropriate digital infrastructure to be in place. The third, the green transition may provide growth opportunities for Latin America. Countries in the region have abundant natural resources and are well positioned to generate green assets, attract foreign investors and mobilize large volumes of financing to support the energy transition, transition and a more sustainable future for Latin America. Last, countries in Latin America can also benefit from geopolitical developments that we are witnessing in our world uh, through the so-called near shoring or French shoring that could bring to the region, not only to North America and Central America, but also to South America could bring investment to boost uh, production and exports to regions like the United States and Europe. So before I end my presentation, I would like to leave with you five takeaways. First, countries in the region have improved their macrofinancial stability frameworks, having heeded the lessons from, from past crises. Second, they have adapted frameworks to current challenges and used them well, including during and after the pandemic. This has anchored in investors' expectations and confidence and leaves them better equipped to deal with the current episode of inflation. Third, central banks in Latin America have acted earlier than advanced economy central banks in the fight to bring inflation back to target. Fourth, fiscal policies have benefited from strong institutions and rules, but consolidation should not be put in doubt going forward. Fifth and finally, Ensuring macrofinancial stability is not enough. As I mentioned before, it is essential for greater long-term growth, but needed to be coupled with growth enhancing structural reforms to grasp the opportunities going forward. I stop here and thank again, uh, the organizer of this gathering for having me here today. So I stay ready for the questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tombini, for the excellent presentation. We will continue now with uh, Dr. Welsh and Dr. Petacola, and then the Dr. Goldzal will take questions uh, from the audience uh, and pass it on to the speakers. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Dr. Biller, uh, Dr. Alexandri. Uh, Alexandri, thank you. That was a great presentation, a great overview. And hopefully what uh, I will be doing is um, complimentary, complimenting that. First, I wanted to thank the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Paulo Tenani, and all the professors that invited me to take part in this webinar. Uh, I would also like to especially thank the uh, Institute for uh, Economic Liberty at McKenzie, at Centro uh, McKenzie de Liberdade Econômica, uh, as, which is also sponsored, now I'm a member of. So thank you uh, all for that. Um, in, um, I'd also like to thank Werner Baer. Uh, we were all students of his. 
Uh, I was very blessed to be his student, and I wouldn't have met all of everybody else if I hadn't been a, a student of his. And so all the people on this call, I know people in the audience, you all were fantastic colleagues and uh, continue to be so, as, as noted by certainly by um, Alexandre's uh, talk. Um, let me now move on to talk about the United States. And I, I'm going to uh, compare it to one of the countries that Alexandre looked at is Brazil. And uh, you can see, you're gonna, my, I can give you just a very quick conclusion. And that is um, uh, that Latin America has now become a model for the United States, not the other way around. Uh, so uh, here are some of the conclusions that I come to, and we'll talk about them in detail. And I, I have put slides in on Brazil, uh, only Brazil, because you could see in Alexandre's talk that you know Brazil is really sort of one of the better uh, macro policy countries over this whole time. And back when people were discussing what kind of letter we'd have a recovery, anyone that's lived through an external shock, and the United States 2008 was not an external shock, it was an internal shock, it was an external shock to Brazil, but you know you get a V, it's arithmetic. You know, if it drops 50% and rises 50%, you still are only halfway back to where you were before. Uh, and so I didn't think there was much of a debate on that, but it was just sort of an amazing thing to me. And then if you, at some point you overshoot and you get an upside down V. So I think some of the arguments for US recession, or at least us, United States being in a recession right now are a little bit precipitous. That doesn't mean I don't think we're gonna have one, but it does mean that we're not in one right now. Uh, the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve increased demand stimulus th through fiscal support, increased monetary growth extraordinarily. And in fact, our fiscal we've never seen fiscal uh, looseness like this in the history of the United States. Even during World War II, there was one year, a couple of years that it was that way. But we have it, we adjusted very quickly, and you'll see that in some of the graphs that I show. And we did a number of things that Brazil did also, created credit facilities for small and uh, medium-sized companies, gave support to workers, gave income en enhancements to the unemployed. Uh, and in fact, the measure that last time I saw, I think Brazil was the number one emerging market country in terms of creating these, these policies and giving help. And also the World Bank came out with something with this rather interesting thing about the drop in absolute poverty. That doesn't mean people aren't suffering still, they are. But uh, it is sort of uh, remarkable what, uh, what the Brazilian government and, and the Brazilian people have done certainly. Um, even in the face of this robust recovery, the U.S. government continuing continued increasing fiscal and monetary surplus. This is the mistake. This is the this is a parallel with some policy mistakes that were made in Latin America, specifically in Brazil when they were coming out of the shock of 2008. The recovery was well on, and they added a lot of stimulus to uh, what was already a good recovery. <clears throat> uh, so U.S. deficits are slowly shrinking, but you're gonna be shocked by the graph that I'm gonna put up here. Those of you who have dealt with Latin American countries and have dealt with countries that have had some fiscal problems over the years. Um, to me, we saw Dr. Tombini showed uh, financial conditions indexes, you know, saying that the United States has tightened, but in January, 2020, uh, our financial conditions were quite loose. So, uh, you know, they went, they got much looser and then came back. And I would just say that, in my view, and I'll try to show that, is that the U.S. Fed has not really tightened, especially real interest rates have gone nowhere. Uh, and certainly monetary-based growth has, but uh, it's just a little le less loose than it was before. And so there's not a lot of resistance on inflation. Uh, we did get an inflation number this morning. It was surprised to the downside. Uh, now we're at 7.7 year on year. But if we all made it to graduate school in this group, Right after the, right during the 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 sort of adjustment that we had uh, during uh, uh, after when Volcker came in and after the 1970s, so a lot of our focus in our macro classes and so forth was on what happened in the United States. And you'll you'll see we saw that very clearly. We had different episodes where we had a decline in uh, current inflation, and then you saw a relaxation of, of policy, and it came right back up again. But even still, we have larger fiscal deficits as a percent of GDP and looser monetary policy than we had in the 1970s. So I'm not particularly happy about the situation, especially being a former Federal Reserve uh, employee. As I said, I don't think the United States is in recession, but the necessary monetary tightening that's coming is, will probably put the economy into one, especially 
uh, it's still, they're at a fast pace, but probably not fast enough to avoid uh, uh, continued inflationary pressure. So let's look at what happened to growth. And I have here back to the 1970s, and I didn't finish the subheading because I just want to see how this thing ends, because I actually think it was probably worse. I wrote something back in June of 2021 saying that we haven't seen anything quite like this uh, in the United States. Back then, fiscal policy was loose because of the Vietnam War and because of the Great Society program, but they weren't this loose. Well, let's see, this was that little mathematical quip that I was talking about, why we were gonna get a V. It's not a forecast, it was just arithmetic, right? So uh, you can see you, get, you drop 40%, you go back 40% and, and you're only back in terms of levels uh, to um, half the, a little over, a little less than half the way back. So. Uh, you can see that you were going to get a V no matter what. And this is many times termed something I ter we termed, uh, my co-authors and I, as the rubber band effect. Uh, the harder you pull down on a rubber band, the faster it snaps back. Doesn't mean that the fundamentals are taking you there. The fundamentals come later. But certainly expecting a, a fast recovery right away. The other thing is when you, you stop walking, you're not going, your velocity is zero, and then you accelerate to going to something positive. Your accelerate, rate of acceleration is very, very high. So uh, not really a forecast, just some arithmetic. So let's look at what happened here in the United States. Here's real GDP through the third quarter. Lots of Vs, uh, a V down, a V here. And then, then we had this thing. And it's sort of like that reverberation of the rubber band. So uh, using this negative or drop in growth rates between uh, last year and this year as a, as a guide to whether we're in a recession or not, I think is a little bit precipitous. I do this decomposition, decomposition both the United States and Brazil of aggregate demand and aggregate supply shocks that dates back to um, uh, uh, Qua and uh, Blanchard and Qua and Vichy, that uh, you, the way you decompose it is you assume that demand shocks have only temporary effects on output uh, and output effects have permanent effects on both uh, inflation and, um, and output, whereas demand effects only affect inflation in the long run. And this is the decomposition that came up with the United States. You can see you had the, the, the double Vs that had to do with uh, supply shocks. These are four quarter cumulative supply shocks and demand shocks. Well, we're now at the other side on negative supply shocks, but you know, with all of the stimulus, we're, we're still having, and these are compounded, over time, because these are the the shocks of that, but these are shocks. These are not uh, levels of demand. You can see that we've never sort of gone negative on the demand shock. So saying the United States is tight uh, in macro policy is kind of tough. Looking at this graph, and let's just compare this quickly to Brazil. Uh, okay, so, uh, here I also put in uh, value added because the differences are net exports because net exports really do affect the overall GDP figure. And certainly what I do is look at in the United States, I look at final sales. And those aren't that bad, actually. When she, the, the contribution of the net exports in the United States hasn't been all that great. But you can see we had the V and then a V. And then, you know, Brazil's kind of settling into a decent growth rate. And of course, it's a guess because it, as uh, Alexandre very much pointed out, it's going to depend upon continued reform what kind of policies are pursued. And not, this is not only Brazil, but this is the rest of Latin America. So far, Brazil you know, and Latin America got through this pretty well, uh, uh, needless to say. And I did the, do the de same decomposition for Brazil. You had good both demand and supply stimulus in Brazil. Exactly why assigning you know, policy to this is very difficult. These are just residuals of a VAR that, that you're structurally estimating. So. But still, things don't look so bad for growth in Brazil. I have to say, we're still having some pretty good positive shocks, both on the supply side and on the demand side. And you can see here, this is what's true in the United States, but it's really true in Brazil over the years. And that's true for most Latin American countries. Set supply shocks really had dominate the shocks of the economy. So these countries tend to be buffeted from abroad and internally. Now let's look at inflation um, and monetary policy. You can see... The policy stance in the United States is not really tight. You know, these are the uh, negative real Fed funds rate. This goes through October. It's uh, it's gotten a little bit tighter, but it's still below minus four uh, percent. And you can see the the CPI inflation is well above the policy rate. 
And the same thing is for the long bond. I, I did a calculation. I wrote a thing called Welcome to Inflation. And it was about the United States. And I did just a simple calculation of, let's say you're on Wall Street and you've only been following G3 countries. And you got there. I left the Fed in 1993. And it was right just when they were about to tighten. And it was quite clear that was really the last time we had any significant inflation in the United States, which is um, uh, uh, right around in here somewhere, right? That's pretty good inflation there. And uh, uh, if you got your MBA, let's say in 1994, that was the last time, that's when the Fed started tightening again. Um, and you were 24 years old, which is typically the age. Then, and you only follow those three, those three areas of the world, you've never seen inflate. You didn't, you, you have to be at least 52 to have seen inflation like we've seen today. You know, you, it, age does matter. It's not really working very well with prospective employers for me, but still, Age does matter in this, and you can see how many mistakes were made and the bad forecasting, both on Wall Street and at the Fed, I'll have to say. It's been very poor, and uh, it's because they really don't have experience. And of course, everybody on this call has had experience with inflation. Um, and the, the, the sort of conclusion we came to, uh, we as the collective we of economists at the BIS, at the central banks, the IMF, et cetera, is when you have an external shock, you don't try to combat the inflationary part of the external shock, but you lean against the secondary and, ter and tertiary price increases. That is, you worry about non-tradables, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The inflation today came in low relative to expectations, but service inflation in the United States is accelerating. The three-month uh, moving average is at 7.8% annualized, and the 12-year is at 72 so on the margin, we're getting a recovery. The services are coming back, or having service inflation, and that has everything to do with expectations. Uh, Dr. Tombini put expectations, and those are expectations of market participants, who I'm kind of criticizing right now, even though I was one. So let's look at uh, money creation too. There's two sides of this. Uh, one prominent economist said looking at aggregates is non-scientific. I would beg to differ. When you're uh, central bank holding on to policy rates, then all the action happens in the, cur the yield curve and in aggregates, right? Because whatever they have to do, they have to sterilize, they have to come in and change the monetary base to, uh, to, um, to accommodate whatever's going on in the market. So if there's upper pressure on interest rates and you're trying to keep that there, your monetary base is going to rise. So I like looking at aggregates still, maybe I'm old fashioned, which I am, but you can see here, a little teeny movement in the monetary base created a pretty big increase, a big increase in, uh, and it's because of scale in uh, monetary base created some pretty significant increases in inflation. If we look at a more endogenous uh, measure of money, uh, that's M2, you can see that it follows inflation a little bit closer, but that's because it, the causality is both ways. Uh, more than the monetary base anyway. And you see, we've had a very big increase in inflation and it followed very big increases in money growth and negative interest rates, okay. So what I did was I wanted to figure out how much more we have to go until we're normalized. And this sort of is like the uh, the monetary conditions indexes that, that Dr. Tombini put up. And that is I took the cumulative monetary overhang. That is the cumulative amount of real monetary base uh, growth since January 2020. And by this index, it's about still about 40% over where it would be normally. And then that was normally before, which wasn't really that normal, but it was still normal. So we got a ways to go on inflation, my suspicion is, despite the number today. And we we do have an inverted yield curve. Uh, and we've had it for quite a while. Brazil does too, I'm not gonna show that, but. Uh, is this signaling a recession? Maybe, you know, the inverted yield curve has predicted 20 of the last five recessions. So uh, it's, it's somewhat of a decent indicator. I don't think we're there yet. Now, if the Fed tightens the way I think they should, and it's still not in the curve, uh, we still have the 10-year bond at four. The two-year is much higher. You can see the, uh, the, the spread between the 10 and twos is not quite as, is, higher still than the, the fives, but still 10 and fives, you can see that uh, I don't think the level of interest rates yet, policy rates in the United States is high enough to, and 
I'm not going to tell you, I have a secret number that I keep to myself. And as Dr. Yancey used to say, you know, God only knows the parameters, but he's not telling. So we have to estimate that. But I do think uh, they still have some more tightening and the market is not completely discounting that. And we've seen it in the market. We've seen, you know, these up and down waves. We're having a huge rally today because of uh, the lower than expected inf inflation rate. But uh, you know, we've had this, well, now maybe the Fed will stop. And now maybe and we have this rally and then suddenly inflation comes in, the Fed doesn't stop and we get to sell off. So I think we've got a couple more of these ways uh, to go. The other thing that was very good about this, uh, and that's really made me optimistic about sustained recovery in the United States. And again, we can make a parallel with Brazil. Is we had a gigantic deleveraging after the 2008 crisis. And then never, we had a little bit of recovery before COVID, a little bit more deleveraging there. We never had, and certainly Dr. Combini knows all about this because he was the main guy that kept Brazil unlevered and really helped Brazil get through the 2008 and this crisis as well with a very strong banking system. The banking system in the United States is not levered right now. So you don't have these uh, deleveraging you know, collapses in markets Real estate's going to be affected, but it's going to be more like the you know gold. You know, a couple of rich people lose some money, but you don't have banks being threatened by the drop in prices because they won't be able to call their loans, et cetera. So this has uh, left me optimistic about growth in Brazil. Not so much on inflation in the United States, not so much on inflation, but optimistic about growth because the banking system is in good shape, unlevered, capitalized, and that's exactly what Brazil did ahead of the 2008 crisis. And that is why Brazil was able to get through it relatively in good shape. And velocity follows that. So we're not getting that acceleration in velocity that uh, uh, that many feared in terms of inflation. But it's the question is, is when will it go up? And you know, it's uh, and it's only so far down that velocity will fall. So really, what we're seeing is any increase in credit, any increase in money, et cetera, has purely and simply been uh, financed by the Fed. And really not much velocity change, not much change in, in money multipliers. And so the Fed is now even more crucial than it was before. And flooding the market with too much money or lower than uh, what we would say equilibrium interest rates is not a good thing. And I went back and did some VARs to see what the outside lag is. That is how much time it takes for monetary policy to affect uh, output and inflation. And I got 13 to 15 months. It doesn't matter if it's on real interest rates or using money, it's the same. So I argued back in Janu uh, January, if they uh, started tightening really fast, not creating any more monetary base, selling some of the Fed's asset, reducing balance sheet and increasing the Fed funds rate, we would have only seen a decline in a real decline in inflation to 2023. And I'm not sure it's really begun yet. Was oil the culprit of the higher inflation rate? No. We look at the relative price of oil. It was higher in 2007, 2008, before the financial crisis. It was certainly higher in the 1970s after the formation of OPEC. Uh, and then the uh, attack, the Iran-Iraq uh, Iran war, which affected Brazil rather, rather significantly. So we're really not, it's really hard to blame this on oil prices. It looks like a relative price increase based upon scarcity. It is a supply shock, but it's a relatively not important one compared to other supply shocks, I'd say. Let's look at Brazil. Let's see what Brazil's stance is. And Dr. Tombini showed pretty much that, uh, that it's tight. We got inflation, 6.47% year on year, down from over 12 that's headline. The core rate, I don't like trim mean, even though my former uh, employer uses it, the Dallas Fed. The reason I don't is that one of our professors, one of our wonderful professors at Illinois, Roger Conker, said, why would you throw out information? And, you know, he was talking about basically successive regression, iterative regressions. But why? there's information there. So each month you have a different set of prices in the trim mean. I don't particularly like it. I like looking at other things. But uh, the inflation rates are coming down, any measure you have. And here's where I really like to look is non-tradables and uh, services. At first, non-tradables did not move as fast as tradables, but everything's coming down as well. 
and this is a very good indicator, uh, a former colleague of mine, Marcella Meirelles, who was at the Kansas City Fed and now is at DCW, wrote a paper at the Kansas City Fed using Brazil as an example, saying that the best measure of core would be non-tradables. And it's a really nice paper if any of you want to read it. Uh, uh, and I sort of, I, I thought it was genius because it, it fit right in with my priors, which is always the case. If someone agrees with my priors, then I think they're geniuses. Uh, and some of them are on this panel. But uh, that's inflation is coming down very nicely in Brazil. And maybe they're a little bit too tight. They are tight, for sure. I do this range of Taylor rules. You know, the top assumes that the equilibrium rate is, real rate is 10% and the bottom is 2%. And we're at the top of this range right now. So I think, you know, the market is now discounting a big, there's a big uh, inversion of the yield curve, a big drop in rates. But I have to say it has not threatened Brazil's growth at all. And so I have to give kudos to the Brazilian central banks on, uh, on this, on this, on their, their set of policies. And that's true for a long time now. And our esteemed uh, keynote speaker had a lot to do with the credibility that the central bank has over his tenure there. And you can see monetary base growth is negative. Credit growth is completely stagnant. So uh, somehow non-directed credit is this white line. It's sort of this, it's going up, whereas directed credit is going down. I don't know how I didn't fix that, but sorry about that. I didn't mean it for it to be invisible. But the private sector credit creation is growing robustly. And it's being, you know, it's basically having some crowding in because of the decline in credit from Banco Brasil and Banidas. Uh, and the Caixa Economica, and it, you're having, I have other graphs to show that you're having a pretty good investment boom that has taken over for this uh, and the private sector. And then if we look at policy rates, you know, backward looking, forward looking, whatever, policy rates are high in Brazil. They're very, very high in terms of real conditions. Now, Let's move to fiscal policy. And this is the one that's most disturbing for the United States. Um, yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> and that is, this is a, the projections from the OMB about the United States primary and nominal balances. And they just assume that they can run primary deficits forever. That is a very disturbing conclusion. Because that means the only reason that the US has been able to do this is because of this, they've been able to counteract any deficits, especially after World War II, with surpluses. It, because right now we have interest rates, real interest rates less than, uh, than, um, than uh, 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 real growth, then, then they think they can do that. But that's not a normal condition. It's not Pareto optimal. It's not the way you can run a policy to bet that real interest rates are going to be less than growth. It's, it's, it's not something you're going to get, especially as we age. So you can see here, the real Fed's funds rate minus the real GDP growth rate is negative, but this is not a normal condition and it's not gonna stay there forever. The only way it stays there forever is the old acceleration hypothesis that inflation will have to accelerate. And if we look at the 10 year treasury, it's the same thing. You have growth rates less than the real, the, the real interest rate, which is not optimal. And we had this discussion in Brazil and Argentina in the 1980s, and it was finally dismissed. If you have a discount rate that's negative for your future debt issuance, you're in trouble. And Brazil's fiscal uh, situation is quite extraordinary. And I, we saw that for all the rest of Latin America, primary surpluses since last year. Uh, you've had some improvement in private sector social security, the nominal deficit dropping rather significantly. And the debt rate, the debt to GDP, whether it's net debt or Total gross debt, I use the general government debt figure, it's dropped from the peak during the pandemic. And it's where we are right now is pretty stable. And those are my guesses as well. So my conclusion uh, is that the economy has had, all the economies had V-shaped recoveries. Uh, and part of it's been continuing in the United States because the US banking system was not compromised in, as in 2008. And I think that's more uh, that than policies. Adding fiscal stimulus uh, accommodated by very loose monetary policy and already strong recovery has led to the highest inflation in 40 years. No recession now, but the Fed needs to tighten a lot more and fast. A hard monetary break certainly can cause a recession next year in 2024. 
But the Biden administration shows no sign of taking undertaking fiscal adjustment. Brazil is better on this one, probably for the first time, certainly in my uh, history. And just one final comment of Elton Werner, and I'll stop there, um, Eduardo. And then uh, is that Werner always accommodated everybody's arguments. And he always had to say, well, what about this? What about this? And always led to thinking and more discussion. And I think we need, as everybody in the United States everywhere, needs to take a, an example of Werner Baer. He was able to educate. He was able to guide. And he really was an extraordinary blessing to all of his students. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, uh, for the excellent presentation, um, comparing US and Brazil as well, very interesting. So uh, without further ado, let me pass it on to Professor Pitekola. Diego, I think you are on mute. I cannot share the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Excellent. Well, sorry about that. First of all, let me say thank you to the organizers. I would also the presentation some... mode, Diego. In presentation mode. The big pantalla. Yeah. One second, please. Uh, I... A little screen at the top on the right. No, no, I know. I, I know. I know. It's just, I don't know why it's not working. Can you look at it? It seems that you are at the end. Uh, of the presentation. Um, okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Go back. Yeah. Yes, no, no, it's coming. Okay, something. Yes. Okay, good. I would say Apologies you were very about. quick. Yes. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Uh, let me say thank you to the organizers. Let me say thank you to the, the uh, Instituto Interdisciplinario de Economía Política from the University of Buenos Aires where I'm, I am a researcher, and this is, is one of the organizers of this event. And let me say thank you to Werner Baer. Uh, I wouldn't be here if it weren't from him. Let me show you some data on Argentina. Uh, you probably realize that when Alessandro was showing his data, when the, the, variable, the, the variable inflation uh, was not analyzed uh, during his presentation because Argentina is, uh, is the bad guy regarding inflation in the region. And uh, let me try to understand why. And so my presentation will be uh, regarding inflation and growth in Argentina in the last 50 years. So we can do together a long run analysis. Over there, you have the rate of inflation in Argentina in the last 10 years, from 2012 till today. Please realize that, uh, note that in, in 2012, inflation rate was on average 20% annually. If you look at the series, you will see that inflation has been growing steadily since 
2012. And the discussion now in Argentina is whether it will reach 100% this year or not. But we are talking about an inflation rate that this year will be between 90 or 100%. If you look at the low part of the, of the, of the presentation, you will see uh, different scenar scenarios regarding inflation rate monthly in Argentina in the next, in the next few months. Last month, inflation was 6%. This month, inflation is expected to be 6.8%. So we are approaching the 7% per month scenario from today till the end of the year. And that, and that will leave us in a 100% inflation at the end of the year. If it is not 100, it will be 95 or 98. Anyway, it's a very bad performance. So as you see, inflation rate has been growing steadily during the last 10 years in Argentina. And we are having a discussion which is very similar to the discussion we used to have in the 80s, uh, uh, a decade where that was, uh, uh, there, that was known for very low growth in Argentina and very high, in, high inflation, and that ended up in, high, in hyperinflation. And, and please note the difference between the forecasts in Argentina regarding inflation for next years and the forecast regarding inflation in the rest of the region. Why am I saying this? Because we have a very high inflation in inertia, but we still have tariffs that are frozen, public services tariffs that are frozen, official exchange rate is almost frozen, and real salaries are very low. So looking ahead, it's very difficult to expect a, a, a lower inflation than the one we have uh, this year, and the ones that we were having the last years. Let me show you what happened with GDP per capita in Argentina compared to the rest of the world in the last 50 years. In the presentation, you have the average of the world in the last 50 years, and the average was 1.4% annually from 1970 to 2019. You look at Chile, the average in the last 50 years was 2.3% per year on average. If you look at Brazil, the average was 1.7% per year during the last 50 years. If you look at Argentina, the average was 0.2% per year. So we had almost no growth in GDP per capita in the last 50 years. So first relationship, high inflation rates and very or almost no growth in GDP per capita during the last 50 years in Argentina. So it seems that we have lost 50 years and these figures are showing that. Compare the performance of Argentina with Korea, for instance, or with Ireland, or with the United States, or with Spain, or with France. In any case, any comparison you do, Argentina is below almost anyone. And in the region is one of the lowest, or probably the lowest, uh, the lowest performance. So there is a relationship between high inflation or persistent high inflation and uh, low growth. Let's see again at GDP per capita during the last 50 years, and you can see that at the end of the pandemic, that was in 2020, we were at the same level of GDP per capita that we were in 1972 or 1973. So again, what you can see is that during 50 years, Argentina had no growth, almost no growth in GDP per capita. But this is not due to the pandemic. This is a long run problem. And this problem has, uh, has, get, has gotten worse during the last 10 years. So the last 10 years, 
uh, you can see from 2010 uh, and until today, uh, the, the fall in GDP per capita is very significant. Uh, from 2012 to 2019, the GDP per capita uh, went down by 11%. And even though we had a recovery after the pandemia, it is still a, a very low compared to what we had in 2010. Over there you have, what would have happened to GDP per capita in Argentina if Argentina would have grown the last 10 years as it was growing before, between 2002 and 2012. So if it would have continued growing at a rate of 2.3% annually, GDP in Argentina, uh, 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 will be the highest uh, in, in 2020 will be the highest of the year. This is exactly what did, did not happen since uh, the last 10 years or for the last 10 years. And that is directly related to the performance of high inflation in Argentina during the last 10 years. If you look at real GDP, the average growth in real GDP was 1.7% 1.7% per year since 1970. So there you have GDP series, real GDP series since 1970 in Argentina. And you can see what happened during the 80s. As I was telling you, the 80s were show 16 years with, with almost no growth in GDP. And those uh, 16 years with almost no growth in GDP, uh, were explained basically uh, by high inflation. And if you look at the right part of the presentation, we are having the same problem again. We have almost not, no growth during the last 11 years. And during the last 11 years, we have been experiencing, experiencing a, a systematic increase in inflation. Let's look at income distribution. And over there, you have a series of income distribution that relates the highest, the richest 10% and the poorest 10%. So what is the relationship between the richest people in the population compared to the poorest rich people in the, in the population? And as you can see, that relationship was 11% in the early 70s and in the 80s. At this moment, that relationship almost double is 19%. So income distribution has worsened over the last 50 years. You can see in the series, of course, what happened in the crisis of 2001, which is the highest in the series. But if you look at, at the tendency, income distribution is getting worse and worse. Each time there is a crisis, you can also see that the crisis of the hyperinflation, for instance, if time there is a crisis, the the floor goes up. We had a crisis in hyperinflation and this relationship went up to 20%. Then it went, back, it went down again, but we had another crisis in 2001, it went up again and the floor is going up. So the, I'll say the good income distribution or relatively good income distribution we had in the, in the 70s is not true anymore. And now our income distribution is getting worse and is similar to the rest of the region when in the past it used to be uh, slightly better. What about poverty? In 1974, poverty was 7%. I'm, I'm talking about people below poverty line. So while poverty measured by the number of people below poverty line, I'll say uh, uh, income poverty, I'll say, was 7% in the early 70s, Today's 38%. So going back to the presentation, in Argentina, the last 50 years, we have experienced persistent high inflation, except in the 90s, increasing poverty, worsening of income distribution, no growth in GDP per capita, almost no growth in real GDP. So that is the, the summary of what had happened in Argentina in the last 50 years with the main variables of the economy. What can we expect 
for the future. First, see at the, at the first row of the table, you can see the, 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 the main thing that, that has to be remarked is that we have periods of small increase in GDP, for instance, in 2015, and then a fall in GDP of the same size. Then another increase in GDP in 2017, 2017 and then another fall in 2018 of the same size. Then another fall in 2019, another fall in 2020, and then a recovery in 2021. So we are basically at the same level we were 10 years ago. This, this year we can expect some growth and we, we are not expecting too much growth in 2023. So we are expecting a 4.3% in GDP this year and almost no growth in 2023. Same thing is true with GDP per capita. We are actually expecting a fall in GDP per capita. Regarding inflation, we are expecting that if we are reaching 100% this year, next year will be worse. Uh, an, optimistic, uh, an optimistic view says that inflation next year will be 110% per year. And notably, please look at the bottom, at the bottom part of the table. Unemployment is still low. We are talking about unemployment rates uh, around 7% at this moment, increasing, but slowly increasing. And that may be the explanation why we are not in a social crisis after these years, because unemployment, income distribution has worsened, poverty is increasing, but unemployment is, is, is not increasing. And that may be the, probably the only explanation why we are not having a social crisis after uh, the behavior of this variable. Let me finish my presentation by saying again, thank you to Werner, thank you to the organizers, and that I'm very glad to be uh, to participate in this seminar and to and to see all friends again. I remain uh, in order to answer questions if there are some. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vic Diego, very much for an excellent presentation about the economy in Argentina. I think this is something that uh, can be used by all of us with our students. Um, before passing the floor to uh, Dr. Godzald, who is going to close the, um, the event with your questions, I would like to thank uh, Alexandre Tombini, uh, John Welsh, and Diego Petacola for the excellent presentations and the participation. I also would like to thank Professor Paulo Sergio Tenani for taking the leadership in so many Latin American uh, pathways and in honor of, uh, of our uh, professor that we all miss, Warner Bear. Uh, Eduardo, why don't I pass the ball to you then? Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Well, thank you all for excellent presentations. I have a few questions coming from uh, the participants from the attendees. And the first one is addressed to Dr. Tombini. And the question reads the following. Is the independence of central banks a norm in Latin America or there are exceptions? Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, thanks for the whoever asked this question. I think, uh, well, uh, when we talk about independence, uh, we have, uh, I think there is a taxonomy there that we might to, uh, need to address. And so, in the, the jury independence is one thing and, and then autonomy and the fact autonomy is a similar uh, issue. Uh, we have countries in the region that have sort of in, early, in the early 2000s have gone from uh, not being independent at all to, uh, in, uh, to uh, experimenting high degree of, uh, of uh, um, de facto autonomy. I think this was, was critical for countries that uh, for instance, uh, implemented inflation targeting regimes at their nominal anchors for, for their economies, for the macro, uh, uh, in a sense that uh, somebody else like the government or a, a governance within the government will fix, will determine the uh, objective and the central bank will have 
the autonomy to pursue this objective using uh, monetary policy instruments. Uh, so if we uh, sort of assess independence or autonomy this way, I would say that most of uh, the countries that have had successful macroeconomic management over the last uh, 20, 20 years or so have enjoyed high degrees of, of autonomy as has been the case of my own, own country. So I think independence is very important and we have seen the results. Uh, much lower and much more stable inflation than compared to, say, the last quarter of the previous century, where we have a number of uh, uh, episodes of very high inflation, hyperinflation. We also have a sequence of financial crises that uh, degenerate into full-fledged uh, economic and social crises. We haven't seen this since the beginning of this uh, century, of this millennium, I should say. And a lot has to do with central banks having the ability to manage their, their own instruments in an autonomous, independent way. Of course, uh, central bank independence is not a panacea. It has to be accompanied by other, other policies, chiefly fiscal policy. I think we have to have in place a fiscal policy that delivers uh, fiscal sustainability over time. Uh, otherwise, if you are in a, an environment of fiscal dominance, there is no central bank independence that will do the trick. So, yeah, very important, needs to be accompanied by other policies. Another policy that I think is important is to have the monetary authorities or the financial authority like central banks in the region, the capacity to deliver on financial stability. Okay. Uh, we have seen in the past, and I was referring to the last quarter of the previous century, many uh, financial crises that had a huge economic and social dislocation in, in, in Latin America. This time around, I mean, the last 20 years, we haven't seen, even during large shocks as we had during the great financial crisis 2008, the tape tantrum, and more recently, the COVID shock. We haven't seen a full fledged financial crisis in any of the countries in Latin America. This has to do with this capacity uh, of, uh, of, of countries or central banks to strengthen uh, prudential policies, to build up buffers, and to use uh, a wider set of policy instruments to deal on the one hand with the macroeconomic stability, on the other with financial stability, because there is no macro stability if you have a full-fledged uh, financial crisis. And I think lots of people sort of criticize the idea of independence because you have unelected officials sort of controlling a very important part of the macroeconomic policy making. I think this argument is very superficial. I don't agree with it. Uh, this uh, sort of the uh, unelected technocrats that compose uh, most of the central bank bodies they have been uh, designated by elected officials following rules that are set, defined by parliaments, which are by definition elected uh, individuals there that uh, uh, define the rules. So I think if you have a, a, a framework with central bank autonomy to uh, pursue uh, its uh, objectives, chiefly, uh, uh, macroeconomic stability, inflation on target, and also deliver on, on financial stability. This together with the fiscal policy that is sensible, that delivers uh, sort of that sustainability over time, then I think you do the trick. Uh, there are other policies, and I'm not going to go into this, uh, just to respond to, to the question of the participant. I think it's, it's very crucial, uh, central bank autonomy or independence, but it has to be accompanied by other policies. May I just add to that, Eduardo, having the Thank same you. experience at the Fed? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, also, uh, the I complement that with that the despite not being elected, they are answerable to Congress in Brazil and in the United States. So when when the Fed officials are called to Congress to testify, they go because they are we were created with the, you know, by the Congress, and they are, they report to the co Congress ultimately. 
But yeah, they're made. Yeah. So there, there is an influence there. It's just that you don't have the same uh, the, the power to print money at the same place that you have it to spend it. And that's really quite important. But. No, just uh, Eduardo, if I may, this is, uh, uh, I just uh, missed this point, but yeah, I totally agree with John. I mean, accountability is part and parcel of this uh, independence. As you know, uh, independence, power comes with responsibility. And I think, uh, yeah, the way to do the to design independence or autonomy has to to come along with a very strict accountability. My experience, I won't go into details, but I had to go to Congress every month in, during my tenure, which was uh, over 60 months. And so uh, I know exactly what you're alluding to, and uh, I think this is quite important. Yes, and Eduardo, if I may add to the question, regarding Argentina, Argentina is a good example of lack of independence and uh, as i was trying to show in my presentation the result of that lack of independence is, is, is one of the main causes of, of the high inflation period we have been experiencing the last 10 years uh, i agree with alexandre that independence alone does not uh, do the job you need much more than that but uh, uh, Argentina is a good example of, of lack of independence and the consequences of that lack of independence. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Another question, and that's uh, to Dr. Tombini again, and it's uh, related to inflation in Latin America. So the question reads the following. Labor shortages in the United States are adding fuel to inflation. Do you see similar wage and labor pressures in Latin America? Well, I, as, as I mentioned, uh, well, first, uh, as far as uh, wage negotiations are concerned, I think we have seen that wages have a sort of a follow inflation, not the other way around uh, so far. Well, there is, uh, I think, the view that uh, wage negotiations are becoming more frequent, which is a symptom of uh, the, the, where we are. Um, but I, I think Latin America has, uh, as, as you all know, very large uh, informal sector. This has been a buffer to uh, in, in crisis of the past. Of course, this time around was a bit different because of the pandemic. Uh, there was uh, less availability, even in the informal sector, sector for for contact uh, uh, amongst uh, our people. Uh, but uh, well, the way we see it, uh, labor markets are recovering, but uh, in, a, in a relatively moderate pace in Latin America. So I won't say that uh, labor pressures are, uh, are main factors of uh, inflation going forward. I think what we have in, in our region is that the, the, the period of inflation stabilization is relatively recent. Uh, it's uh, 20, 25 years uh, for most countries, not all, as you know. Um, so, and, and this fact that uh, this is a recent period of inflation stabilization of uh, financial stability, I would say we never had the luxury in Latin America to see through large inflationary shocks. Like uh, for instance, advanced economies have done, not this time around, but uh, very recently, they will say, well, you know, you know we have a mainly a sort of a supply disruption. We have uh, changes in relative prices that are here to stay. So let's see through this uh, hump in inflation and let uh, the automatic stabilizer of the economy do away with inflation this haven't happened, right? And now uh, central banks are reacting more forcefully to fight inflation. In our case, in Latin America, we never had this luxury. I mean, even if the inflation shock, it's large, but uh, coming from say supply uh, disruptions, we had to react because we had to, to keep inf inflation expectations uh, from uh, uh, 
from rising. We have to prevent uh, inflation from entrenching in our uh, system. So uh, I've seen this in my own experience, but in other countries that uh, uh, confronted with a huge inflationary shock, uh, irrespective of the origin, you have to, to do something about that. So that's the luxury that advanced economy had in the past, not anymore. And we didn't have uh, at all in the, in the past. Eduardo, can I talk about the United States on that a little bit? Because yeah. um, I just start out with a general question to all the economists listening. How do you tell the difference between a supply shortage and excess demand? They do, both manifest themselves exactly the same way. That's why I do that decomposition, because what I suspect is happening in the United States is both. Because you have excess demand for labor, you have two jobs roughly for every one person unemployed. But uh, is that excess demand or is it is the fact that you've had a, a labor market shortage? There are labor market shortages in different pockets of the US economy. And that has to do, that's structural. You don't have uh, the demand for what uh, the, the, the workers are giving. We also had incentives not to work because you're, you're basically paid to stay at home. And that did have an effect. Uh, if it's properly looked at econometrically, it had an effect. And also we have a demographic problem in the United States and Latin America does too. Uh, Latin America is aging very quickly, almost, and Brazil is aging probably the fastest of everybody there, at the same rate that China is aging, and Brazil did not have a one-child, one-family program. So you're having a lot of people in the pandemic, and we saw some of this in the, in the, um, in this, uh, the 2008 financial crisis, people just retire. I'm not retired, by the way, okay? So, but uh, a lot of people just said, the heck with this, I'm going to take time to retire because I am, the, in effect, the last year of the baby boom. I was born in 1959, and the baby boom is basically the end with, ends with me. And I'm definitely very close to retirement age, but I'll never retire. That's impossible. But I think you have a number of things going on. You have clearly excess demand policies in the United States that are way too loose, and you have some structural issues. The combination of both is leading to, and as uh, Alexandre pointed out, Wages are not keeping up with inflation here yet, and that's not leading to um, uh, a catch up, at least on, on the employment front. Certainly, our unemployment rate is very low measured, but uh, also is our participation rate. So uh, we have a lot of things going on at the same time. So we both have supply problems and demand, and some of the supply problems are starting to go away. Perfect. Thank you. I have actually, I'm combining two questions, two ideas of Dr. Kola, the, of Dr. Kola, that are related. So here they are. Uh, it appears there was no uh, benefit in Argentina uh, due to the supply chain shock since it is, since the country is an ex exporter of commodities. Is, is that true? And how do you see uh, the country getting out of this stagflation scenario? Well, no, I think Argentina did benefit from, from the supply shock in commodities. Uh, it, uh, first, it benefited at the beginning of the century a lot. If you recall the, the series, the GDP uh, theories I sought, I, I, I showed uh, during, between 2003 and 2012, the increase in GDP in Argentina was remarkable and was basically due to the price of commodity. Now commodities are high again, and this is this has helped Argentina uh, to recover very fast from from and from the pandemia, and it has helped Argent because if not that the situation in Argentina could have been worse. So uh, I think the price of commodities helped Ar Argentina because the situation would have been worse. And it also helped a lot to finance the public sector because you probably know that there are uh, taxes to exports in Argentina and that those taxes to exports are very high and, and basically they finance the public sector. So uh, I think that without the increase in price of commodities, the Argentina situation would have been worse. Um, uh, 
I don't recall the other part of the question, Eduardo. Sorry. So what needs for the economy, for the Argentine economy to get out of this stagflation okay. scenario in the short term? Yes, well, that's... Uh, I, I, Alexandre pointed out in this, this out in his presentation. Uh, what you need is what the rest of Latin America also need, but in the case of Argentina, this is more important. We basically need a consistent macroeconomic policy, which is something we, has, we, we, we haven't had in the last 20 years. So uh, since, since the crisis of 2001, we were very lucky because prices of commodity went up, but uh, we never had a consistent macroeconomic policy. So we need a consistent macroeconomic policy uh, uh, and we need to, 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 we need to, to do structural reforms that we, we started in the early 90s, but we never finished and basically yeah, and most of them uh, uh, U-shape in the sense that it, they went back. For instance, we privatized uh, almost all uh, state enterprises in the early 90s, and now we, we again have uh, a lot of state enterprises with huge deficits. Uh, so it's that, like we have to start from scratch, but we, are, we have to start from scratch, in a worse situation than we were in the in the early nineties, because uh, poverty is higher, income distribution is worse, and as I show in the presentation, GDP per capita almost did not grow. So we are in a worse situation than we were in the early nineties. So in that sense, I am not very optimistic. Thank you. So I, I have a technical question for, for John or for Dr. Welsh. It is probably from a, an economist or a student in economics. It's uh, based on your uh, end to velocity forecast. Two years from now, where would you see inflation and interest rates prior to the presidential election in the United States? Oh, he's gonna pin, pin me down to a number, okay. Um... Uh, I expect inflation to stay roughly at the current levels if they don't do something. So the presidential election is going to be in 24. Uh, and I expect the Fed to tighten rather significantly into next year. A little late. I don't think this recent respite from inflation is going to change their view at all. So I suspect we're going to have very low growth, if not a recession, going into 24. And unfortunately, they probably, with the credibility they enjoyed before, which doesn't now, would have been able to get a lower inflation rate without having that recession. But I do expect inflation will get down to four and a half, five by the end of 24. But I think we're going to see some very low growth rates, if not negative, for the year uh, 2024 and going into 23. Perfect. Thank you. Another question for Dr. Tombini. Uh, let me summarize the translate and summarize this. What have been the major success and major failures in the recent management of global monetary policy in Latin America? So success and failures of, of global of monetary policy in Latin America. Well, I think uh, as, as I tried to convey during the presentation, um, we have seen quite a successful response uh, from central banks and I say from countries in Latin America in the last 20 years. This time around with the pandemic shock wasn't, uh, wasn't different. Uh, of course, we, uh, as I mentioned, and we know inflation is high in some countries coming down, we still have uh, work to do there, uh, but we haven't seen, uh, of course, in, in Latin America compared to advanced economies, there was an early reaction to this inflation surge. Uh, countries start uh, tightening policies in early 2021, uh, much earlier than, than other jurisdictions. We haven't seen any financial 
uh, shocks to the system, uh, systemic shocks, I should say. Uh, so this is uh, another uh, important uh, feature of this this time. We uh, well, I think uh, to to be uh, uh, more balanced, uh, there was a, a, a assessment, in the, especially in 2021. I mean, many, uh, if not all. Uh, underestimate the speed of the recovery, the kind of uh, stimulus that were put forward, both in the monetary, but also in the fiscal side. So there was uncertainty, of course, as we know, we remember there were sort of a waves of COVID. Uh, when we thought we were out of the woods, we were not anymore. So it was back and forth. But then with the rollout of vaccinations uh, and things are starting to, to open up, especially in the Western, uh, part of the world, I mean, we have seen with the with the uh, with the stimulus plus uh, with the vaccination rollout, we, we saw a much stronger rebound of the economy that uh, initially envisaged. Right? There was also uh, uncertainty regarding the extent and the depth of uh, the supply disruption, the global value chains that was were being disrupted. Uh, by the uh, response to the pandemic. So it lasted longer. So as you remember, there was a debate whether this was a transitory or uh, sort of a relative price shock or was more permanent. I think this debate was put behind uh, in late, uh, late last year. Uh, but I think the important thing here is the central banks are focused on the, on the mission, right? I mean, uh, I mean some, some central banks uh, well, Latin America, of course, they started earlier. Uh, interest rate differential with uh, advanced economies is large, adjusted by risk. Of course, it's narrowing, but it's large. Uh, yeah, but there was this, uh, this debate of whether which has been rested uh, as of now. And, um, and we see if today you ask central banks, and I think some have been, have been very explicit to say that What's the major risk that we confront today? Is it doing too little or doing too much? And I think the prevailing uh, answer to that is, is doing too little. Okay, so we are in the process. We are in, and uh, countries are tightening their policies. Uh, and I think that's, that's the most important uh, thing uh, um, that, that we have right now. Latin America did earlier. It's ahead of the, the pack, and this has been important to understand why capital flows have been relatively muted. It's true that in the last three years, not much came in because of the pandemic and other things, but we have seen very muted uh, capital outflows, maybe some outflows in the bond market, some inflows in the equity market. So it is stable for our, our standards, right? And we have seen for the largest economy in Latin America, remarkable stability in the exchange rate. When would you think that uh, given the way that uh, advanced economies are conducting now the inflationary fight that you'll see like this uh, large currencies in Latin America being so stable as they have been in the last say several months. So I think, yeah, I mean, there are issues there, but uh, all in all, uh, it's been a very successful ride so far for Central Bank of Latin America. Good point. Thank you. I believe that John Welsh has a, a question to Diogo. Hey, Diego. What a, a very great presentation. I wish it was a little happier, but I have a question for you because, again, we have these people that are under 52 years old in the United States, and we've had, you know, we, in the 70s, we used, um, the United States used, uh, price ceilings on gasoline and so forth that led to rather large lines. And that subject has come back as a policy option in the United States. Perhaps you could comment uh, on the recent history, you know, talking about Venezuela is not really useful, but Argentina is because it's still a market economy more or less. And maybe talk a little bit about Argentina's experience with price controls. Well, uh, Argentina has been experienced uh, price control over the last 10 years, at least, yeah. uh, trying to cope with high inflation. Uh, you know that price controls are not the answer to high inflation, are the result of not being able to fight 
high, high inflation. And that's, that's exactly the case in Argentina. And this government has been using price control uh, during this government and during the 12 years that were uh, in the government before, and they, ha they, they have been failing systematically. And now they are doing the same thing again. So uh, I don't want to, 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 to get into politics, but uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the economic policy makers uh, from this government, they do believe that they can, they can cope with high inflation, they can fight high inflation with using price controls, and at least temporarily. Uh, they have been trying to do that the last 10 years uh, unsuccessfully, and they were, and they never recognized that the problem behind uh, this, this, this level of high inflation is mainly fiscal, fiscal problems and monetary problems and not, uh, uh, and not the firms fixing prices. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more question, and this will be open to, to our panelists. And, and the question is the following. Aren't you worried or aren't you concerned about the fall of productivity growth in the US and Latin America for sustained long-term growth? Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Tombini. Well, I think, uh, yes, uh, one of the challenges, and I, I uh, mentioned three challenges in the, in the short run is to rekindle uh, higher uh, long-term growth in, in Latin America. We had, uh, since the bust of the commodity cycle in 2014 and 15, and then now with the pandemic, we've seen that uh, uh, long-term growth has uh, uh, declined one notch down from, uh, already low levels and when you take the average of the largest economies in the region so but i'm optimistic uh, in the sense that uh, first uh, digital has been a reality in, in, in most countries in, in the region we here at the bis americas have worked with uh, central banks from the caribbean central america all the way to argentina and uh, countries are moving very fast in this uh, digital dimension, uh, not only in the financial system, we have very interesting experience here in Mexico with Cody, in Brazil with PIX, very successful. So this uh, digital innovation in our countries can uh, so support productivity growth going forward. And I'm optimistic about that. Of course, we need the, the right infrastructure, but we need the right policies for this to come to, to fruition. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned is that uh, since uh, most of the countries in this region have a natural resource in abundance, I mean, this is the, the best position region in the world to generate a pipeline of uh, sort of uh, green projects that could uh, amass large amounts of, uh, of external financing. There is money, there is the will, there is, of course, you have to have the uh, right policy, you have to have the right risk for investment, investments from other parts of the world to, to flow into, to be funeral to, uh, to Latin America. And, and so this is, this is a, a very important uh, uh, development that the region can take advantage. And last but not least, of course, uh, we have uh, geopolitical developments, which are challenging to say the least, uh, but in this respect also, in Latin America, uh, it's uh, a way of, of most of those, um, most countries, so I think they can benefit over the medium term of this near-shoring tendency that we have, as we have seen to sort of to access a market, affluent markets like the United States and uh, Europe. Uh, so all in all, I think there are fields here that should uh, be exploited by, by the region to increase uh, long-term uh, growth uh, going forward. But of course, you need the right policy, you need macroeconomic is, is stability is a necessary, financial stability necessary condition. But uh, yeah, I'm optimistic in this sense. 
Thank you. Yeah. Diego, please. Yes. Well, in the case of Argentina, I am optimistic if we stabilize the economy and if we make structural reforms. I mean, uh, if we don't do that first, I'm not very optimistic because the investments are not coming. Uh, and that will be will, will make productivity growth very difficult. But I agree with Alexandre that Latin America and Argentina is, is, is part of Latin America and Argentina has natural resources, energy resources, and human resources and, and uh, uh, and in, in, in those sectors, uh, uh, minery too, in mining too, and in all, in all those sectors, uh, the, the, potential, the potential growth is, is very high. But in, as I was saying, given that we stabilize the economy and we make the necessary structural reforms. If not, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not optimistic. And if I have, if I have to look back, uh, I have to be pessimistic, but I try to be optimistic. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> I like that too. And John, I think you have your final um, word. Let me just focus on two things for productivity growth. Uh, and they, I think they both, it applies to Latin America, especially Brazil and Argentina uh, and the United States. First, trade policy. Uh, trade policy is crucial. Uh, the United States over the last couple of years has become uh, increasingly protectionist. Uh, that has not changed with the change of administration at all. In fact, it's gotten even more protectionist on that front. Uh, and that and Brazil is continues to be one of the closed economies, the closed most closed economies of the world. The countries in Latin America that have opened to trade have done better, especially Chile, Colombia, and Peru. Why? Not only just the gains from trade, et cetera, and the idea that maybe imports are good, not bad, but also the transfer of technology is also quite important. The second thing, and this goes to uh, many of the things that Diego said and also uh, Alexandre, uh, is that the best measure of productivity is per capita GDP. We have all these different things, but per capita GDP if everyone says that you know Japan has been such a disaster, but their per capita GDP growth has been this above the United States for the last 40 years. So I don't see how that can be called. It. It's just that they had a denominator shrinking as opposed to growing. Uh, and uh, a lot of this has to do with the creation of jobs that are productive. And that not, doesn't mean necessarily corporations. I remember in 1985, when I was doing my dissertation in Brazil, the labor reform that finally was passed under President Temer was already in Congress. It took that long for Brazilians to be able to open up their own company without having to be completely constrained by the labor courts. And oddly enough, not oddly enough, Brazil is the champion now in startup creation worldwide. And it's extraordinary how much this has happened. Brazil has so much talent that was being hindered by the fact, uh, you know, you make a startup, then you next thing you're being sued by a former uh, employee. Allowing as much as possible within, within you know, uh, property limits, the growth in companies, growth in uh, uh, innovation, et cetera. And the two complement each other quite a bit. And I think, you know, I would explain some of the slowdown in U.S. productivity growth due to the sort of slant towards protectionism. And you know, certainly that's been off and on in the case in Argentina as well. So trade and labor, they really, you need more deregulation in those two areas. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I would like to say uh, a big thank you. If, if the, the speakers, uh, if you don't have any more comments, uh, anyone? If not, I would like to thank you. Eduardo, yes, just to, to thank you again and thank uh, thank uh, Paulo Tenani, my, my fellow panelists here with Dan moderating. I just wanted to say that it's a, it's a privilege to be part of this uh, tribute to this quintessential Latin American scholar, which was Werner Bear and a Brazilianist uh, um, from the heart. And uh, so I'm very happy to be a part of this. Thanks again for, for having me here. Thank you. Well, thank you all.
Uh, without any further comments, I'd like to pass the word to FGV. Uh, it's a more, be a more technical issue here. Uh, thanks for FGV again to, to sponsor the event, the seventh edition, and uh, we all can uh, log out now. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Great to see you.